I have a very highly qualified panel of experts up here that I'm happy to introduce. Um, they're going to share with us some tactics we can all keep in our toolbox when we're communicating. And the good news is it doesn't matter if you have a huge budget or no budget. There are tactics beyond TV ads that everyone can use, and that's what they're going to explain to us a little more today. So first, I want to introduce Brendan Burns. He is the National Digital Director for Stand for Children. Um, he's got quite the background, kind of a combination of working with various sectors, and he's an expert on digital strategy, grassroots, public affairs, and social media. So we're going to dive into the social media topic for those of you interested in that. We also have Felix Schein. He's over there. <laughs> He's with Rally. Um, he, his organization was instrumental in communicating um, the Vergara issue, which I know he'll dive into a little bit over in California, that lawsuit. And he's also an NBC News veteran. We're happy to have you, Felix. Um, we also have Devin Foley. He's co-founder and president of Better Ed. And he'll also talk about Intellectual Takeout, which is a great great organization as well. Um, he oversees content development and marketing for Better Ed, and he's got experience working with candidates and um, nonprofits around the nation. Then finally we have Mike Thomas. He's one of my colleagues at the foundation, and he is a skilled editorial and speech writer, award-winning journalist with more than 30 years of experience. He used to be with the Orlando Sentinel, um, and he's also a Gator. So, go Gators! <laughs> Um, I'll start things off with, with Brendan, if you could kind of dive into the topic a little. I know you have some examples for us on, for online strategies. Well, thank you, Allison, for uh, having me today. I certainly appreciate it. it. It's hard to believe that you know we were here one year ago and we talked a lot about digital media, social strategy, et cetera. It's a year later and we're still talking about it. It's something that is not going away, despite all of the uh, things that you hear in the news, despite the articles that will come out on January 1st about, you know, this is the year that email is going to die. This is the year that Facebook is no longer going to be important. This is the year that Twitter is going to go away. There's a new social network that's going to happen. All of those things will be said here in the near future. But here's what we do know. Email, for certain, is not dead. It's not going away. Email has evolved. Things have changed a lot. But it's not going away, and it certainly is not getting any less important. It is still the absolute number one way to communicate with constituents, to communicate with your audience, to communicate with people around the United States about issues that are important. But segmentation is important. And what segmentation is really about is finding messages that are relevant to the people that you want to communicate with them on. It's what they care about. So for instance, this year we launched a campaign over the summer about high quality assessments, right? Sounds kind of like a boring topic, but we wanted to get a lot of parents on a list that were interested in this topic and were passionate about it. So we launched a petition drive. We asked people to sign a petition for higher quality assessments in their schools. We didn't think we would get that much of a response, to be completely honest. We thought, you know, it's testing, it's assessments, who really cares about the difference between one test and another? But we saw an overwhelming response. We had over 15,000 people sign a petition about high quality assessments. And then we launched them through an email series over the course of a few weeks. Um, you know, the first email was about the difference between a good test and a bad test. The second email was about uh, the anatomy of what invo what's involved in a good test and a good assessment. And what we were shocked by was the fact that three weeks into this, we were seeing email open rates that were over 45%. It's the highest email open rates we've ever seen on any subject ever. They were high enough that I called our vendor. Um, I called the email company that we use and I said, something's wrong with your product. Uh, I think it's broken. Um, the numbers are too high. And so what we've learned from that is that if you're communicating with people about a subject that's interesting to them, that they're passionate about, that they care about, they will engage with it. So it's important to continue to add audience segmentation onto your emails. It's how people are going to be opening their emails. It's how people are going to be paying attention and resonating with your information into the future. The next thing that we learned in 2014 is that if there's any constant in this universe is that Facebook is absolutely going to change and it's going to mess up all of your plans. Um, it, you know, it messed up my plans in 2013. It messed up my plans in 2014. It's probably going to do it again in 2015. One of the biggest changes that we saw in 2014 is that Facebook changed their algorithm. You know, the old math used to be easy, right? You have 250 friends on Facebook. You post a message. 250 people see it. Um, they changed that 
equation in 2014 so that if you are managing a page, so a business, an organization, a nonprofit, an elected official, or something like that, uh, not everybody sees that. They pick and choose who gets that information displayed to them. And so what you're seeing is that uh, when we used to be able to post something and we'd see our reach hit 30,000 for something basic, uh, now we're seeing it in 2,000, 3,000. And so what that means is one, we have to start delivering better content because what Facebook is doing is it's analyzing who really wants this information and who wants to see this information. And if the content is good, you're seeing an increase in people that are paying attention to it. What it also means is that it has kind of changed the game in terms of pay for play. Um, if you pay money to boost your posts, you're going to see a huge amount of reach and engagement on Facebook. I'm not talking thousands of dollars here. I encourage people to spend $15, $20 a week on boosting their posts. You can spend $5 on boosting a post on Facebook and see the engagement and the reach rise dramatically. It's something that I encourage people to build into their budgets moving into 2015. Um, and visual-based messages are still key. Anybody can come out and say, Happy Halloween. Anybody can come out and say, you know, uh, this is Education Week. But doubling down on that and displaying it visually can help people emotionally resonate with the message better, and you will see a much higher level of engagement. Here are two examples where we took something that was basic, something that, um, you know, it, it was the anniversary of Nelson Mandela's birthday. Um, you know, we found an education quote that was relevant to what we wanted to talk about. We used it with an image. We had over 150,000 impressions on this one image. That same message without that image gets 5,000 impressions. So using that image and using images um, really helps elevate your message. Now, this took us five minutes to put together. This wasn't something that took you know, a graphic designer 15 hours to create. This is something anybody can do. It's something any organization can do. It's something any elected official can do. Uh, it's certainly something your staff can do <laughs> in a short amount of time. This is another instance of just using an image, an a poignant image, along with some text uh, to elevate something that's happening. You know, we hear from people all the time that you know, it's, it's not election time, it's not legislative session, I don't know what to talk about for education. There's no such thing as a time where you can't talk about something like this. You can find a reason. You know, it, it's Thanksgiving, come up with a ways to thank a teacher. You know, it's Valentine's Day, you know, send a Valentine's Day card to a teacher. There are things you can use to talk about education any time of the year. And using images in order to do it can be extremely helpful and extremely successful. Now say you're getting really good at this. You have thousands of people that are hitting your Facebook page all the time. They're seeing your images. What is bound to happen is that you are going to meet the lowest form of human on the internet. <laughs> we, we, we refer to this as the internet troll. Now we, we, you all know these folks, right? Um, they're the first person to comment on your Facebook post. They're the first person to say something really rude on your Twitter feed. They are the people that occupy so much of your time. But here's the truth. You don't have to engage them. You don't have to feed them. Um, they are never going to be on your side. It doesn't matter what you say. Uh, the smart move here is to come up with a moderation policy for your Facebook pages, et cetera, that runs through kind of how you are going to engage with your audiences. So for instance, on our Facebook feed, we have a pretty general rule. Um, if you are contributing to the conversation in a thoughtful manner and you are adding to the dialogue, your post stays up. We won't delete it even if it's negative. That's fine. We want to engage and we want a lively discussion on that page. But if you're just coming out there and saying something negative and crazy, no, we're going to delete it. And the reason for that is, is that negativity breeds negativity. And when you see a lot of negative posts on a given page, people don't want to engage with that content. They don't want to say something positive. And so uh, getting to a point where you're moderating that content, you're moderating that debate, and getting it lively on your page will help. Because what will eventually happen 
is that your own folks will begin to defend yourself on that page so you don't have to do it anymore. Um, you know, a great example happened last week. We posted an article about Common Core and about teacher support of Common Core. And uh, the very first post, you know, it's a lovely person who we know is going to post on everything that I ever post up there. And the first thing she says is, I've never met a single teacher in my entire life that supports Common Core. Four posts below that, or four comments below that were a series of teachers that said, you've just met one, you've just met two, you've just met three, you've just met four. You know, that's, that, that's the dream. And that's what we need to continue to uh, hope for, and that's what we need to continue to strive for moving into 2015. So with that, I'll pass it on to the next panelist. All right, um, next we're gonna go to Felix, who is going to tell us a little more about his experiences and hopefully turning questions into more opportunities to share our messages. Perfect. Well, that was great messaging right there. That's exactly how you do it. Um, so I'd like to start, before I get into the slides, with sort of three just kind of contextual uh, statements based on our experience in the space. And most of our experience has been around the Vergara case, uh, which challenged tenure and dismissal uh, in the last in first out policies in California. We did a lot of poll data testing uh, prior, prior to that case and prior to the messaging that, that we launched. There are really kind of three key takeaways, I think, for this group. One is that the public does not understand public education. And I'll give it to you in an anecdote. We had uh, a series of parents in focus groups. All of the parents had children in either a charter or a magnet school uh, in Los Angeles. And none of the parents, there were more than 50 in those focus groups, could tell you the difference between those two types of schools. Um, none of the parents in the room could tell you definitively whether both of those schools were public schools or district schools or some other type of school. Um, what I found most interesting, there was a parent in the group who had taken her child from one, uh, from a magnet school and moved her to a charter school and had assumed that she had done exactly the opposite of, of that. And so the main takeaway, I think, for me is that this is an incredibly complex topic. And so item number one is that we sort of as a group need to simplify uh, as best we can uh, whatever it is that we're, we're doing. Two is, is that messaging is not a mystery. So everything that we do can be tested one way or another. And my hope is, is that everybody in this room uses messages that have been tested to some extent. Um, I'm a little, I'm both encouraged and a little disappointed in the civil rights frame that we're using here uh, in this conference, in part because Democrats overwhelmingly don't see education as a civil rights issue. Um, while they think we have an obligation to educate children, they don't think it gets quite to the place where you have a civil right or a fundamental right to a public education. So messaging everything in a civil rights context is a little bit difficult. And I'll say I came to this um, a little bit reluctantly. Uh, in the Vergara case, which was brought overwhelmingly uh, by Latino and African American students, our entire frame to start was in a civil rights context. Uh, and when we went to go test it, it actually returned uh, terribly uh, from, from the polling that we did. And so I do think that needs a little bit of massaging. I think you can get people to a place where they see this as a civil rights issue, and I, I, so I'm encouraged in that direction, but be careful with, with how you phrase uh, some of that. My third sort of framing point is one around quality versus reform. Uh, we talk a lot about us being a reform movement. And when you test the word reform, I think it reminds most people of some kind of punitive um, <laughs> process that they may have been engaged in in their own uh, childhood or otherwise. <laughs> and as a whole, I actually think the quality narrative is a much more accessible one. And actually, it's what we're all advocating for, quality schools. And, and however you define quality or what you mean by quality, I think, can be fairly broad. And so. If I can leave with another takeaway, it'd be I'd hope that everyone walks out the door today and considers themselves not an education reformer, but a quality advocate, an education quality advocate. And it makes it much easier to interact with you. And the last sort of, before I get into the slides, is um, something that John White, Superintendent White, who introduced uh, Joel Klein the other day, uh, talked to uh, at a previous conference, uh, where he talked about the idea that maybe the reform movement or the quality movement, as I would like to call it, is, is now mainstream, that we're no longer a fringe guerrilla movement. And uh, I think to some of the points here on this panel, it also means, if that's true, that we need to behave a little bit differently. Um, in a guerrilla movement, you can kind of pop up, make your message, and then you run back into the hills and then hope for sort of a counterattack that misses you, or you, know, you can hide out in a hole, or whatever the deal might be. Uh, when you're in the mainstream, you can't do that. You can't move the target uh, quite as quickly. And this is actually a, this is good news. So I'd, I'd be, I think we'd all be upset if after many years we all still felt like, felt like we were on the fringe. The fact that I do think we're mainstream is, means that you're winning in, in many states, but it also means that the target on your back is, is much bigger, and so your uh, tactics and strategies uh, need, need to change. The Students Matter uh, case in, in California um, was really an attempt, so for those of you not familiar with California, um, California is a overwhelmingly democratic state. We have a supermajority uh, in the legislature. 
uh, we have an elected Republican governor um, in a sort of normal election setting uh, in my lifetime. Um, and so legislatively, that's a state where you're going to achieve uh, very little as far as it goes, as far as the reform uh, side of the equation or quality side of the equ uh, equation is concerned. Just for context, the California Teachers Association spends more on lobbying than tobacco, oil, and healthcare in California combined, and that's an oil-producing state. Um, so you have a sense of their magnitude and their, their influence. The Vergara case was really an attempt uh, by us to do two things. One is we wanted to bring change, but the second was to drive a narrative and to try to put students in particular uh, up front. And it started with sort of a casting for who could be in that case. And so we went out and you see the plaintiffs here uh, speaking uh, lined up uh, in front of the flags, which went out and found students to be plaintiffs in this case. We had the option of um, using teachers. We had the option of using parents. Um, I think we had the option of hiding who the plaintiffs were. Um, but we felt that the student voice was largely absent from any of the debate. And so a key metric for us was to decide, was to measure whether or not the word student ever appeared in any of our particular coverage. And I think from the headlines here, you can see that that worked. And there were really two reasons for that. I mean, one is I think reminding people who it is and we're working for, why do we do this work? It's ultimately about the students in the system. And the second is, is that students are very hard to attack politically. Um, and I'll give this to you in a bit of an anecdote. The California Teachers Association, when this trial opened, which had a fixed date, had decided that they would do a rally and that they would bus teachers in uh, from across the state to rally in front of the courthouse. And you had to reserve a public place in order to do that. So not being particularly eager to see that event play out, um, our sense was, well, what would happen if you put students, the students who were bringing this case in the middle of that rally? Wouldn't that make it politically difficult? It's not a terrible image to have teachers essentially yelling at, at students about um, a student's right to go to court to fight for their own rights. And so we placed a podium in the middle of that particular park um, and had our students go to that podium and hold a press availability. It was the last time they announced a rally. They never ended up having that rally, and they never went forward with the rally. And I'm not trying to be cute here, but what I'm trying to suggest is that students at least are our greatest asset, and yet we use them the least frequently in all of our messaging. Um, so to the extent I can add to my opening few comments, that would be, that would be one, is put students front and center as best you can. The second is, is, is validators. So not only can students be your voice, but then there need to be other people who can speak to that. If, for those of you not familiar with Lawrence Tribe on the left, Lawrence Tribe will never be confused with a Republican um, or with somebody who would otherwise be associated with education quality or movement or reform. Um, but post-trial, uh, Lawrence Tribe, who's a great civil rights attorney, um, came out in favor of, uh, of the case. And I think he did so in part because we also tried to avoid an anti-union frame. So this came up a little bit here. Again, poll data in California, the union has a net favorable of over 70%. I mean, it's right behind sort of kittens and puppies in terms of like how much people like these people. And so an anti-union message is both politically, I think, not smart, but it makes it very hard for someone like Lawrence Tribe, one of the best litigators uh, in our country's history, to come and land at, uh, in a place where he can, he can communicate with us. Arnie Duncan obviously depends. He sometimes has this concern, sometimes doesn't. But same thing, I think it was attractive for Democrats uh, to land, and then he ended up becoming a validator speaking about Vergara, which was, was a powerful thing. Um, Mayor Johnson, who's married to Michelle Rhee, obviously has none of these particular constraints um, speaking about ed, ed reform. But he was a very vocal and very important leader in California. And so for all of you, my hope is, is that in addition to putting students out in front, that you then go gather validators to go support what it is that they're saying and to support the policies that you all are, are, are pushing for. And then just building off, I think, the opening presentation, do this across platforms. So to do it just in newspaper is definitely not good enough anymore. You want to be doing this online. Uh, you want to be ad adapting your messages, and in particular, the way you're framing them for online. I'll, we'll go into this a little bit in the Q&A, so I won't belabor this. But you know, infographics, anything visual in that particular context, I think, is, is really critical. Um, and looking at the media as more than newspapers and television, I think starting to acknowledge that there are bloggers, acknowledge that people are uh, prolific on, on Twitter, uh, that Instagram feeds have tremendous numbers of followers, and that you can drive mainstream press off of uh, a social platform is, is fairly critical. Uh, the other piece here, I think, is I think we tend to have a, a reaction that says we, we should only be for some things that are critical to our movement. So we're going to be for choice, or we're going to be for vouchers, or we're going to be for, um, you know, insert whatever your favorite issue is, but we're not going to be for things that aren't in that sort of relatively narrow box. And I think, again, the data suggests that we ought to be for lots of other things in education that are low cost to us, but high return from a public perception uh, perspective. I picked two of my favorites. I don't know why anybody would be against healthy lunch. 
I can't quite figure that out unless you're maybe a lunch supplier. Um, <laughs> and, you know, again, you don't have to do this, you know, I picked this headline, but I mean, you don't have to do it in a political frame. I'm not suggesting you have to go out and endorse Michelle Obama or her particular work if that's not your, your politics. Um, but being for healthy meals or being for art or PE in, in schools is a relatively low cost thing for us. I think it makes us much more human, much more accessible in many ways. And I also think it's, frankly, a much more honest picture of what makes for a great public school or a great school experience. Similarly, uh, I mean, we heard this this morning a little bit, suspensions and, and uh, school discipline is a huge issue. It's really bubbling up. A lot of the groups that are most interested in that issue aren't education groups. They're actually healthcare foundations and criminal justice organizations, many of whom would be priceless sort of advocates and allies for you to have in, in other fights. If you can signal that you're interested in their issues, they may be more interested in, in your particular issues. So I'd encourage you to expand the, the, the tent, as it were. And the last one is, I don't know how many of you saw the Time cover or the article, which was all about Vergara. It was actually a very good article, I think a very fair article with a really shitty cover. Um, and um, this is where I think we as an organization actually made a mistake, and I, I put it up here quite humbly. On the right are Randy Weingarten's tweets about the cover, and uh, they got about 80,000 people to respond to that particular cover in a very short period of time. Um, and I think it's a great example of, I think, the other side having taken it one step further. Not only do they have sort of teachers as their main uh, spokespeople, which is smart. Not only do they have sort of a deep bench of particular validators, which is smart. Not only have they tried to frame sort of their education platform broadly, which is smart. But when they're under the gun, they respond very, very quickly. And they respond collectively. And this brings me back a bit to Superintendent White's comments again, where he said, we're in the mainstream now. And one of his biggest laments was not that we're in the mainstream, not that we're winning, both of which he loved, but was the fact that whenever he gets into a fight, and often a fight that we encourage him to have, right? So go out and be for X, Y, or Z, he has lots of policy meetings with us. And then he goes and does that, and the arrows start coming, and he turns around, we're all gone. Right? We've gone back to that kind of original foxhole because we aren't comfortable being in the mainstream yet. And I, I, I took that to be, I think, actually really insightful. And I think you heard it a little bit today, uh, this morning in the, in the session that Campbell hosted on the stage, where you know, these guys are doing unbelievable work under incredibly difficult circumstances. And the union certainly has the teachers' backs. To the extent that we can have our backs, I think it becomes a much more uh, even playing field. So I uh, look forward to the questions and uh, really appreciate you all attending this morning. Uh, Felix mentioned the changing media, and I think that's something Mike can elaborate on just um, in your experience, and also as a professional translator of gobbledygook, give us some tips. Is this on? I'm from the print side, so I don't have a PowerPoint. Um, I'm also the only member of the foundation whose spouse is a member of the teachers' union. And that's our school board member over there. Um, the, the media, as you know, it, it's just changing. The media I grew up in doesn't exist anymore. Um, it, and it's, it's changing all the time. It, it used to be you had reporters who were veterans. They had a lot of expertise in the areas they covered. Um, they would write stories that were way too long and they would put them in the paper and throw the dead trees on the driveway and assumed everybody read them. And then came the internet and we put stories on the internet and could see nobody was, was reading that. And that, that created an, a, a different dynamic as the advertising also went to the internet. And so staffs were cut back and and the bean counters would say, well, it costs $20,000 to do this in-depth research story on education, and we'll get 400 clicks on it. Or we can spend $50 to do a story about a home invasion, and that'll get 20,000 clicks. And that's, that's what's happening. Um, and it's kind of discouraging, so because when you click on the story about the home invasion to pull it up, you'll see four advertisements for burglar alarm companies, and so that's that's sort of where the where the media is going, and it, it is discouraging, and so you have a lot of younger reporters coming in because they're buying out the dinosaurs, and they don't have the depth of knowledge. Uh, about subjects and they don't know how to do research. 
And so th what they'll do is the simple conflict story, call up the teachers union and, and they will, you know, land blast, destroying public education and, and, and all their talking points. And then they'll call us and we'll start giving them NAEP data. And, <laughs> and so it, it, it gets very frustrating. And in conjunction with that, um, it, it used to be that you went to the editorial board and made your presentation and all these learned people would, would pass judgment and, and write an editorial. And then they found on the internet that nobody read editorials. Um, <laughs> so you're, you're, you're seeing newspapers greatly reduce the editorials. And, and so we've got simplified news and editorials. And then on top of this, reporters, there isn't the same accountability that there has been in the past on accuracy and, and things like that. So, um, and there's more opinion injected in things because re all reporters want to be columnists. And, and so it, it, it is a challenge getting a message across, particularly from the perspective of the foundation because we're, we're just very factual and everything has to be, you know, exactly accurate. And Christy right there is, <laughs> is, is about the most brutal editor you could have. And, and, <laughs> and so the other side isn't playing by the, the same rules. And so we go back and forth and, and how to push back. And, and instead of dealing with internet trolls, there's, there's op-ed trolls who, <laughs> you know, continually write letters to the editor and, and there's no accuracy check there. They can say whatever they want. And so it, it is, it, it is a, a challenge and um, I'm, I'm learning more about these guys' world all the time because, because that's where things are going. And I think we have to, to find new ways to get our message out. And we have to be creative and, and that's, and people, people sometimes get lost in that because you know, the, the first impulse is to run to the mainstream media, to, to push back, to write an op-ed and uh, and if it gets in and you're, you're, you're relying on somebody else's good graces to, to grant you the privilege of putting your material in their publication. And so I think we need more ways to, to get out our message without that filter. And Facebook and, and what these guys are talking about is the future and, and how you do that. And I, I don't know how that bodes for my job, but... <laughs> um, but I'll, uh, I'll close it there and we could maybe talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, we're going to get to elaborate a little more on being effective in the uh, appropriate use or worthwhile use of an op-ed in just a little bit. We're going to jump next to Devin, who has, I think, some more unconventional tactics that we can think about as well. Thank you, Allison. So... Thank you for having me. Uh, with intellectual takeout, uh, that is the 501c3 that under which uh, Better Ed is a project. And what we did, we spun off of a state-based think tank, and it was to address a lot of these issues as we looked at it. Uh, the traditional way that oftentimes the Ed reform movement, as well as and we come from more of the conservative side, has been working on issues is to start at the legislature. You'll often see policy proposals, these sorts of things. Well, it, as has been pointed out, the teachers unions, others, they, con they control the ground game pretty well in that area. And so what we looked at is the need to actually directly communicate to the public, that the public has been left out of a lot of these discussions, particularly on education, and so that we need to create that groundswell for change, to be able to get the facts out there about high spending, low performance. And so with intellectual takeout, we started broadly. Uh, we looked at Facebook and social media as a great way to be able to quickly reach a very large audience 
for a relatively low cost. So we grew uh, from 2010, we've grown to over 1.1 million uh, Facebook subscribers on a couple of different pages. Uh, and this brings up a question too for any group that's out there. It's who is your target audience? What do you want to say? So what we did is actually break out our audiences into different demographic groups. We have one audience of just moms. It's over 500,000 strong nationwide. Hand that rocks the cradle rocks the world, right? So we looked at that as a very uh, a strong group that we want to be continue or, uh, in communication with. Another group is millennials. Uh, our intellectual takeout audience is primarily millennials. Uh, the generation coming up, it's been a very good audience, a very strong and engaged audience. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we have with those two audiences and then our better ed audience. And what we did was take the intellectual takeout and the mom think audiences, what we learned there communicating nationally. And you can see the orange line. We have the blue line is tracking our audience size, but on a weekly basis, our average reach is about five million. And so that is a very outsized impact for a relatively small organization. We use it a lot. Uh, at the communication session yesterday, it was somebody, and I don't know what, who said it, but to listen to your audience. Uh, and Felix has made the point of testing your message, things like that. Your Facebook audience actually provides a very, very good way to be able to test messaging and to be able to listen to the public. You are going to learn more about what the public cares about through your Facebook audiences, uh, then I would even argue a lot of polls will tell you. Uh, and so we took all the lessons that we learned there and applied it to better ed on the local basis in Minnesota, and we now have moved that forward, and I'll get into what we're doing there. It's our argument that we need a new education system. Uh, we haven't, we're not working to trim around the edges or things of that nature, and I know some groups are, are doing that, and that's good, uh, but we want to set the goal over here. Anything that moves that goal along, great, we're moving it. Uh, but we start, so we launched again, Better Ed, and again, we looked at it from that perspective, directly communicating to the public. And we're very unique in this. We're the only group out there in Minnesota that's directly communicating, and for the most part, uh, nationwide, we're relatively uh, unique in our approach. Uh, we took, again, our Facebook, what we learned on Facebook, and nationally, and then poured it into Minnesota. It's a smaller audience, uh, 31,000, but you can see Education Minnesota down there with 3,193. That's the largest teachers union in the state. One of the largest, of course, uh, lobbyists and spenders in the state as well, but we have a 10 times the size of their audience when it comes to social media. The reach, what's fascinating is the reach of this page is half a million to a million people each week. Uh, it has an exceedingly outsized influence as far as communicating ideas. And we often get uh, regular emails from people who want to volunteer for us. They'll come in, they'll say, oh, I've, been re I, I've had so many friends forwarding your stuff to me, and I see it all the time, that I just I decided I had to do something. I have to get involved. How can I help you? And that's one of those things where you start to see, wow, this is actually a very powerful tool to be able to get information out there. And I should say, too, when we look at the education reform and the public in general, we see a couple of obstacles to change. Again, you're driving mostly this policy side, expecting a legislator to be able to say, hey, this is a great idea, I'm going to vote for it. Well, if their constituency isn't for it, or they're getting pressure from special interest groups, they're not going to budge. And I think we all know this in our hearts. And so how do we change the public's uh, opinion about these things? Well, we have to start with what does the public know versus what is reality? Friedman Foundation came out with a poll a little bit ago, and it was fascinating. I mean, you had basically a quarter of Americans thinking that their public schools spent $4,000 or less per student. Well, in Minneapolis, it's 21000 In a lot of our suburbs, it's close to $15,000 per student. That is an enormous difference. And it's fascinating when we started to point the numbers out, and I'll show you how we did that. Uh, but with that 21000 you started to see a lot of comments out there where parents would say, wait a minute, I have three kids. I could hire a private tutor for $21,000 a kid. 
And that changed, fundamentally changed, how they looked at education. And that was just simply by giving them the information, the truth about what's out there. But then combining it with low graduation rates or low proficiency, it really, the, the public is allowed to come to their own conclusion. We ask a lot of questions. We put the information out there. We're not attempting to lead the public to a, a specific conclusion. We're allowing the public to be able to make up its mind. But when it looks at things like, again, $21,000 per student in Minneapolis, and you have a 54% graduation rate, and you have reading proficiency at 42%, the public's just saying, things need to change. This isn't right. This is not good. And so we start to see that groundswell moving. So how do we move that needle and directly communicate to the public? With our Facebook audience, again, it's been said by uh, Felix as well as Brendan, you need to do it creatively. You need to use images, things like this. Adrian Peterson, he's kind of the man of the hour these days. Um, so I figured it would be fun to use an example from him that we actually used uh, last year. And so we, in Minnesota, we're actually dealing with an issue where the Minnesota culture is such that they think that we're fine. We are great. We're the best that's out there. Maybe Massachusetts, but they're not Minnesotans, so they're not as good as us. And yeah, the rest of the country is terrible, but we're great. Uh, and it's an interesting attitude because you also see it played out in the national polling. You've got the lowest co public confidence in the public education system. I mean, it's at an all-time low. But when you ask parents what they think about their individual school, overwhelmingly A or B grade, but the numbers don't bear that out. So we have the very tough, and unfortunately, I mean, it is tough. You'll get a lot of arrows, and it's a difficult process, and you have to be nuanced about it. But you have to show parents that, no, your school's not actually doing that well. Your kids aren't performing that well, even compared to kids in the state, let alone the national statistics that we're seeing up, up there. And so we want to counter that. With Minneapolis, uh, you know, our sports teams choke regularly, uh, so it's just, it just it's, it's what it is. Um, but so we took advantage of that and said, yeah, we lost to Detroit, but we're still better than everybody, except we pointed out that Detroit grad rate is 65% and Minneapolis was 50%, and that was at the time we had those numbers. So we also use it to do charts and graphs, be able to point out the difference between, you know, the public schools and Global Academy, and this is where, again, we're trying to take down some of those myths that minority students, they're just not doing well in our system. Well, here's an example of minority students doing remarkably well compared to their peers. They're in a charter school that's right next to the same uh, public school district. We also are unconventional. You'll have a postcard in front of you. That's the first one that we dropped uh, into Minneapolis, and we just basically drop into the residence. It's a direct communication piece that enables us to be able to do quite well. Uh, we've done, I believe, about a dozen postcards now into Minneapolis, fundamentally changing the game. We get a lot of earned media. You can see this is uh, just one example from our first postcard. What's great about earned media is they often reproduce the postcard. Uh, and so now we've reached a whole new audience. And it's fascinating, too, because the critics are often saying, you know, they come in with the tone and expect their commenters to take a negative approach to us. But the commenters are often saying, wait a minute, are those numbers real? If those numbers are real, we, we have a problem, uh, you know. And so again, getting that information out there directly to the public. We've also put up billboards. Uh, these billboards are directly across the street from the Minneapolis Public Schools headquarters. <laughs> you can see that there. Um, and so again, it's, it's been up there for six months or so now. And we just change it with some frequency to get the message out there. Um, it's, yeah, it's it's been fun. The the so it gets a lot of it gets a lot of uh, attention, and it's worked quite well. Again, we got a lot of earned media because of it, and again, they reproduced the billboard. The billboards did the work for us. Uh, the news, of course, KSTP went through and they compared our numbers. They found that our numbers were right, and then they compared to other districts. Again, uh, being able to get those numbers out there. And so we look at it as a success. Everywhere you go, you now see this $21,000 being spent and basically half the kids not graduating. At that point, we now can have a very new discussion about what needs to happen. When the public understands this is actually bad, there is enough money being spent, there's a problem in the actual system, and that's an important thing to do. We don't attack the teachers, we don't attack the unions, we just point out, look, the system's failing. You got, we need to do something about this. And so that's where we see a great opportunity to be able to make change and an example for everyone here. Thank you. Thank you.
have a question for um, both of you, actually, Brendan and Devin, relating to graphics. I think a lot of folks here, some people have communications staff, some people don't. And so where would you begin if you needed to make a graphic quickly with a fast turnaround? A lot of us have approval processes that we have to go through along the way, and so that can also be a challenge. But are there resources like a, an online site where you can freely make graphics if you don't know how? Help us understand that. Yeah, I mean, certainly not everybody out there has access to Photoshop and a full Adobe suite and a graphic designer and many of the things that I'm fortunate to have <laughs> at our organization. But um, there are certainly online products that you can use. There are cheaper products that you can use. Um, you, there, you don't have to have a $500 Adobe package in order to make graphics. In fact, you can make, uh, and here's part of the key, right? Just because the graphics are beautiful doesn't mean that they're gonna perform any better from the graphics that are kinda ugly. Uh, graphics that are kinda ugly oftentimes work just as well as those beautiful graphics you see done by my designer. Um, so you know, don't, don't worry too much about making a beautiful graphic. Worry more about the fact that it emotionally resonates with the audience that you're trying to communicate with. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, you've got to, as far as the approval process and other things, uh, in our shop we have someone who does a lot of the graphic design work for us, um, but those who are running different Facebook pages will often do some quick work on their own as well. And that brings up the, uh, the approval process. Uh, again, it comes down to structuring how you structure your organization, and you've got to understand that in the social media world and in the communications environment that we're in, you, you do not have necessarily all the time in the world to approve something. You've got to move quickly. And so you have to have a lot of trust in the people that are running things. Have a, they have to be a part of the culture and you have to just basically have that understanding with folks. This is how we run. This is how we operate. And you need to lay out your simple goals too, very specific goals. What do we want, where are we ultimately going so that your staff can actually say, okay, if I put this out, does that line up with our overall goals? And so that's where they're basically moving along. And also to be honest too, to think through, how might this image be perceived? What are the negative sides of it? Uh, does this have, try and critique your own stuff as much as possible and tear it apart so that you can anticipate how it might be attacked or simply don't put it out there. And that's really important. Absolutely. And media relations is obviously important. It's not, not completely dead. We still value it. Um, so I, I'd love to hear from Mike and Felix just on is there value in developing relationships with reporters? I know that can be intimidating for a lot of us. And, and where do you begin with that? Um, no, it's, I, I didn't mean to completely ignore the, <laughs> the media. Um, people still do read, and it's still imp important to communicate, and, and, and I really stress that, of getting to know reporters and of possibly sitting down with them for coffee or something, because when they meet you and sit down with you, they're not going to be so quick to pull the trigger, particularly when they appreciate where you're coming from. And, and when you do that, just be prepared and, and have, you know, organize in your mind the four or five main things you, you want to get across, you know, bring your material and, and phone, you know, phone numbers and, and text and, and just keep control of them and, and encourage them to always call you whenever they're going to write about something to get your feedback and as soon as you build that relationship then it's just be, it becomes just a, a, a much more balanced um, presentation um, for your you know for your side so so I yeah I very much encourage you to to find out your the reporters who are working on that and build a relationship with them yeah I think I'd go just expand on that, I agree. I, look, I think we're in the relationship business, right? At the end of the day, um, everything we're trying to do requires some sort of person to take action, um, whether it's a legislator, whether it's someone on the school board. Um, and in many cases, I think the press is a critical component of that. So they, they're both a validator of the arguments that we can make. I think in some cases, they signal that it's safe to take a certain action. And certainly in a political context, uh, reporters matter. And so relationships with reporters uh, matter. But I might go a step further, which is I also think you have to be careful about who it is you're trying to move and why you're trying to move them. So I wasn't trying to be flip about the politics in California. Um, 
we work very hard, and my firm is, certainly does much more work on the left side of the aisle than the right, um, but we work very hard to try to attract Democrats to Vergara, which takes on tenure dismissal in LIFO, which is, um, at least at the outset when you first hear that, um, a little radioactive, I think, for a lot of folks on that side of the, of the aisle, my, many of whom have strong union support. And so reporters, when reporters started to validate the argument that, that these particular laws that we were challenging do disproportionate harm to Latino and African American kids in, in California, it became safe for Democratic politicians to say the same and to start to take, take a stance on it. And to his credit, our, our governor um, has actually uh, largely embraced what this case did um, in the middle of a reelection fight. Um, so it's, I think that's another reason you want those relationships. The other is that reporters themselves are great sources of information. So it's not just a one-way relationship. It's, it's, you know, they hear about a lot more than we tend to hear about, in particular, I think, in the halls of the legislature, assuming you're not a legislator. Um, and so that, that, that's a relationship you want to milk. Can you tell us a little more about an editorial board visit and what that is? How would you even get started with something like that? Sure. So um, editorial board visits are, uh, you can schedule them. You call uh, the editorial board. You um, make a pitch as to who you are, why you're coming in. Generally, you need to come in at a time where uh, something you're talking about is germane, so it's being debated in some sort of forum, and they can write about it. Um, those visits have changed over the, over the years. So you used to go, and they were largely sort of on background. You weren't generally quoted directly. Um, now they tend to be both filmed and then put on the newspaper's website, and they often have a beat reporter in them. But I strongly encourage uh, those of you, not just those of you running for re-election who are seeking endorsement, but those of you who work for foundations or entities, to go meet with editorial boards, both so they start to see you as a, as a reference and as a source, but also so they may take a position on, on an issue that you're working on. Um, and and one, one addition to that is, is the columnist, the local columnist, is, is usually read more than the editorial board. Um, in 2010, Governor Rick Scott blew off editorial boards, didn't go to one of them. Every one of them um, vehemently opposed him and endorsed Alex Sink, and Rick Scott won the election. And, and that, was, that was a hard lesson <laughs> for, the, for the newspapers. And I, I think what you, uh, one strategy to use is just find the most popular, you know, the local columnist who is, he's on the front of the state local page and he's got a lot higher readership um, than the editorial board and, and persuading him on your side would, would be a, a good strategy. While we're on the topic of media relations, I do want to touch back on the op-ed process and when would be an appropriate or helpful time to, to, to spend the time and effort with your team to write and submit an op-ed and when is it just not really worth it? <laughs> go, go ahead. Um, yeah, so op-eds, um, I think someone, people will argue with me as to whether or not they're still worth it. I, I still think it's probably worth the time to, to, to do it. Um, Look, generally a newspaper isn't going to write about something that isn't newsy. I mean, the word news and the headline sort of suggests that that's what they, they need, right? And so writing something out of the blue where there's no, nothing legislatively happening or imminent, uh, there isn't some event or something you can tie it to, it's very unlikely you're going to get that piece placed. So having new data or, or, or some sort of a news peg to, to tie it to is, is critical. Uh, the second, I think, goes back to the validator slide. It's who's the op-ed coming from. So it's an interesting way to insert another voice into the space and to signal to folks who's with you or, or who's supporting what, what you're doing. Um, most good op-eds will have some tension in them. So like any good newspaper story, you need to have uh, tension in the piece itself. So they're not going to allow sort of a shameless self-promotion of your organization and how great it is. Um, you have to be taking on something of some kind um, in the same way that a novel or a good book has a little bit of tension in it. Um, and then placement is, uh, is still sort of uh, a love of labor. I think you have to work at it. Um, so a little bit to Mike's point, I think you want to find the outlet that's maybe most, uh, most suitable for you or that's going to do the most, whether that's the paper of record in the Capitol or somewhere else, and then kind of work backwards uh, from there. I will, I will say that I, I know while we're all sort of negative in terms of papers, bigger papers, and it's definitely true their circulation numbers are down, the, the very local papers are actually thriving. Um, and so in many places, we've actually started to just try to place op-eds in very hyper-local papers. And the beauty of that is you can place the same op-ed in about 25 different outlets rather than having to rewrite for every, for every paper. Um, one thing we look for, because um, 
The, the other side is, um, has, as we've discussed, a much bigger ground game. So they have an endless number of, of unionized teachers to write op-eds, uh, legal women voters, uh, and all these different groups. So, so, so we can't match their, their numbers. Um, so uh, when we push back, I guess we look at the publication, and then we look for, for factual errors in, in things that they've written, and then that creates sort of the friction you're talking about where you're saying, well, they, you know, pointing out their mistakes, they're wrong, and then correcting them with the right information. Um, writing well matters because they want to, you know, when they're putting something in their newspaper, they want people to read it. And length matters. Uh, if you send them 900 words, you're giving them editing permission to cut out 400 of them, and <laughs> you're not going to control which 400 they cut out. So you have to use a lot of discipline and focus and, and just stick to the, stick to the length, and, and they'll tell you what that'll be, or you can look at their submissions and, and, um, and do that yourself. I'm going to switch us back over to social media tactics a little bit, but are there new tools or strategies that we haven't mentioned so far? We've talked a little bit about Facebook, things like that. I'm curious to know um, if there are any new things we should be aware of. I, I won't say that there are a lot of new social networks out there that people are, you know, running towards. Now, every month there is going to be a new social network that comes out, and every month someone is going to proclaim it to be the next Facebook killer. Um, you know, I think we saw one recently called Ulio. Uh, you know, these will always come about. You know, the, the short and long story is, is that uh, none of them are going to kill Facebook anytime soon. So, you know, picking which avenues and which social media outlets you want to invest your time in is important um, and maximizing the best use of your time. You know, you don't need to be on 50 million social networks. You can probably pick uh, the top three or four and concentrate on those um, and just figuring out where your audience is and what makes the best sense for you. Um, there has been a lot of movement in the last few years in terms of tools that help you manage your social media presence and tools that help you uh, activate your social media. So things like Buffer, which is a, a posting tool where um, you don't have to be on Twitter every five minutes sending out an update. You can go on Buffer and you can write 15 updates and just put them on Buffer and Buffer will automatically post them to you over the course of time. Um, that works for Facebook, that works for Twitter, um, you know, you can even use it for Instagram. And so in terms of time management, I think tools like that are extremely effective. You've seen a rise of products like Buffer, like Hootsuite, um, things like that to help you manage uh, your social networks and to help you manage the amount of time that you're spending on them. Yeah, I think uh, to Brendan's point, uh, as far as new social media, there, I mean, you have Instagram, you have Twitter, Facebook, of course. Uh, I think that it, you need to understand, too, how each of those work and uh, the tools that work best. I mean, Instagram is exceedingly image-centric. Uh, Facebook is working towards that, uh, both images as well as articles, things like that. Uh, new, fresh content works well. Uh, what we found is Twitter will have more of the policy, the legislators, folks like that, so we can communicate a different message to each of those audiences. I think, too, it's important to look at it. Um, you you want to make sure that your content isn't just dry and really boring. Uh, and you just see a lot of that out there. Uh, you need to figure out who is my audience. I mean, we're directly communicating with the public, so it's basically trying to relate education material to the public. What are they interested in? What are parents thinking about? I mean, they're actually thinking about all of these things. I mean, parents are, if you think about the life of a parent, it is, I got up in the morning, I fed my kid, we're going to school, I gotta make sure they got their homework done, then we get after school sports, doing our homework, all of this. I mean, they live and breathe education in many ways. And so there are a lot of areas that you can do that. And I would emphasize too, again, uh, reading all of the comments, taking the time. I mean, it will, when you have a large audience, I mean, sometimes we'll have a thousand comments on just one, you know, or two thousand comments on just one post. Uh, and I mean, but again, we've had posts that get seen by one single post, seen by five million people, actually 11 million people was our top end. Uh, 
you read those comments, you're going to learn a lot about it and then ch be willing to change your efforts and always be adapting to uh, what's working, what the mood is of your audience, all of those points. So. Thank you. Before we start taking questions, I also have one more question for Felix. In terms of media relations, public speaking, um, opportunities to communicate, can you give us some tips on message discipline and really just driving that message home, successful media relations tips? Sure. Um, I mean, some of this is not going to be particularly revolutionary, I don't think, but, um, you know, we work in a complicated space, and so trying to distill down sort of a very complex notion into a very simple message, I think is key for all of us. Um, you know, that's why I'm using this quality education frame. One thing I do encourage is that you look at each other's work. So um, creating an echo chamber to some extent also uh, makes the spread of a message much, much faster. Um, and it also means adoption will be much faster. Um, so, you know, taking the best of what you see in the space, replicating it for your particular uh, work uh, is critical, and that's sort of your, you know, your meta narrative, as it were. Underneath that, and I think everyone here has talked about this a little bit. You're going to have some specific talking points to to what it is you're doing, and repetition of those talking points is is relatively critical across, again, all platforms in a public forum and elsewhere. I think events are useful, actually, as a um, not just to present your ideas, but also to get uh, feedback from the people that you're speaking with. And so, I do encourage all of you, to the extent you're doing events, to open them back for um, question and comment and often also for you to be asking questions, because I think you start to hear sort of what's resonating and what, what isn't resonating uh, more broadly. You know, we're all immersed in this work at a level that nobody else out there is and understandably isn't. And so uh, I think we have a lot of assumptions about what they understand or hear that aren't, aren't necessarily true. And so events help, help uh, uh, drive that. I think the last point I'd probably make on this front is, um, you know, we haven't talked a lot about sort of how do you get to a message. I, I think with all of our clients, we tend to start with First, the question of what's your goal? What is it that you're trying to achieve broadly for your organization? Then we try to work backwards uh, from there. Almost all of our new client meetings start at the opposite end, where they say, you know, I need a message set immediately for, uh, for something. If you start with your goal, it gets a lot easier to define who it is you're actually trying to move um, and who you're trying to talk to, um, why you're trying to move them. And then you can start to distill your messages from there. And then you could go to a tactical piece, which is, you know, do I place an op-ed? Do I do an event? Do I do a public forum? Um, but that should really be at the bottom of your sort of checklist in terms of, of process. Thank you. We'll go ahead and start with the question and answer period and can go to the microphone there, please. Hi, I'm Captain Ed from the Florida Keys, um, but I've been active in statewide. I was involved in all three of the Governor uh, Bush's uh, campaigns and I'm a lifelong registered Democrat. Um, I think a lot of the, the measured success we have is because we're targeting far, far too small an audience. All the discussions I've heard are, are about people with kids in schools. In my demographic in the Florida Keys, 80% of my taxpayers don't have kids in the schools because we have, it's an expensive place to live, so it takes a while to make money in your life, and so maybe your kids are out of school, retirees and so forth. There's a lot of other places in the country where you need to look at that demographic. If you're just preaching to people with kids in the schools, uh, those aren't the people who elected me. The 80% of the taxpayers don't have kids in the schools and want their money well and carefully spent and produce results. That is a much larger target. I'd like to, like to have some comments from you how you reach that, reach beyond just the population has kids inside the schools today. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, essentially what we're doing right now. I mean, yeah, that's, that's what this really does because they're showing taxpayers that they're spending $21,000 and and only half of it's paying off and uh, you know that's I think this is is a great a great piece it just says so much and then it it it, it invites you to learn more and um, and it so that's I think that's a very good way of reaching that, that broader audience. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> with, with, um, I don't know if you call that carpet bombing. Is that what we call that? I would never no. use that term. Well, <laughs> no way. Uh, no way. Um, well, how, how would we do something like that if, if, if we were interested in targeting a certain zip code? I know not everyone has the budget to do a mailer, but where do you begin with something 
Like yeah, that. I think you need to look at it. You can't just do one postcard. It's going to get lost in the mix. So ours has been a two-year effort, and it will continue to be an effort, and we've expanded it into a suburb. Uh, it's interesting how people react as well. If you want to be able to do this, just take your budget, be able to look at, okay, where... Uh, most of us are small shops. We have limited budgets. Uh, it, it does cost money, but you have to say, how do I get the most bang for, for the dollar and be able to... Uh, make that impact on the public. So you're going to know your own geography better, the demographics of your area. You want to be able to look into and say, okay, this city, if we use this city as an example, which is what we're doing with Minneapolis, where it's, again, it's $21,000 per student, half the kids are graduating or don't graduate. And so you're looking at that, and that's it makes a very good backdrop to a conversation about education. Uh, and it, those waves go out much farther. And so again, the broad public is talking about this. So you just want to, again, know your area, say, OK, where can I get the most impact? Which, which audience will move the most? Which school or school district is a good example of how things need to change and failure and be able to be able to use that? So. Next question. Oh, sorry, over here. Hi, I'm Veronica Conforme. I work, I'm the head of the Education Achievement Authority of Michigan, um, a turnaround district in Michigan. I uh, wanted to, uh, in working in Detroit, so I'd love that slide that you put up there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so two, two part question. The first one is, uh, and Brendan, you talked about this, um, the, the power of using students you know, to really um, ensure that the discussion is about them and not about adult issues. So uh, wondering if anybody is doing work engaging students uh, in social media uh, around these issues and what, what examples can you point to? Uh, and the second part of my question is, um, how can you leverage an event like a speech or other things to also be uh, points of uh, conversation and then adding on to it. Or like, how do you build around something like that? Thank you. Sure, so I, I'm happy to uh, address the first part. I think using students' stories and using parents' stories are always going to be the most compelling things that you can do. And I think so often as organizations, we get lost in um, telling stories from our executive directors, you know, telling stories from our development staff, telling stories from myself. And really, that's not the power, and that's not what resonates well with the audience. And what resonates well and what we know works well is using those parent voices and using those student voices. Um, students are a hard group to organize online. Uh, they are, um, you know, they kind of want to do their own thing. So, you know, in terms of organizing students, I've always found it best to, um, one, work through the parents, get a group of students together, and then two, give them ideas and then let them kind of run with it because you're never going to be able to control what they do. Um, and you know you have no idea where they're going to lead you. So uh, that, that's what I really recommend. Yeah, what we've found is that, again, we haven't done organizationally, we haven't reached out directly and tried to organize the students. On the flip side is what we found is just having students in our audiences that they will run with the materials that we give them. So there's a group of students that want justice in Minneapolis, and their Facebook backdrop is our billboard. Uh, and so you'll see that yeah. popping up. You also see, again, it's worth going into the comments, even of your local newspapers and others, if these conversations take up, because that's where a lot of parents will actually vent, uh, and they'll be able to talk about what they're doing. And you can highlight some of those examples if you, you know, can confirm the parents actually legitimately pointing out and has these experiences and things like that. So there are a lot of, you know, uh, unconventional ways to be able to use that and highlight it that we've done, so. Yeah, I might jump in on your speech question. Yeah. So I think on the speech side, and I'm just gonna refer to moments largely, I mean, a speech is a moment, right? Something on the calendar, and there are gonna be lots of moments uh, out there. Um, so one is that stretch the calendar, right? So it's past that particular day. That day is sort of in the middle of what ought to be your, your planning calendar. Um, in the lead up to your particular speech, I mean, one is you obviously want to engage press. You're sending an advisory, you're maybe sending an advance copy of that particular text. I think you want to start to see the audience with certain people um, so that they can comment on it afterwards if there are reporters in the room. You want to give other organizations, and it goes a little bit to your question, sir, where um, if you can give other organizations, business groups, um, if there's a democratic organization that maybe wants to weigh in, you know, somebody that's reaching an audience you want to reach, 
Uh, you give them a heads up, maybe they can write an op-ed or play some content ahead of time uh, around the speech. And the, you want to drive some social media going into it, maybe you're going to post a video of that speech on your, on your site, maybe you're going to put a little bit of money behind it to promote it. And then going out on the, on the other end is you want to send out highlights or summaries and, and share your message from that speech with other organizations who in turn might put it in a newsletter uh, and so forth. So I think there are, you know, you really have to think about your universe broadly. Who, who is in your orbit in, in, a, in a broader sense? Who might take what it is that you're doing and amplify it or add their little twist to it? Um, you know, and, and it's not just a day. It's, it's a, maybe a week or two leading in and it's a week or two leading, leading back out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, B Bill Obendorf Foundation for Excellence and Education Board Member. Uh, Devin, I think it's just fabulous what you're doing. Thank you. You've been doing it for two years. What has happened as a result, though? Uh, are you seeing legislative action? Are you seeing anything happen in the state? What's, what are the outcomes? It, it's interesting. What, uh, you know, we're unfortunately in a state right now where the governor's been consistently vetoing any piece of legislation for school choice, for LIFO reform, things like that. So there's a certain frustration at the legislative level where I would say what we've done is actually definitely had the public rally around this topic and create space for a lot of other organizations. It's been really interesting to be able to see there are a lot of progressive organizations who can work on the ground in Minneapolis and elsewhere better than we can. Uh, but we've created the space and emboldened them to be able to push that needle. And so now you're seeing uh, both the newspapers in town as well as these other groups, as well as the legislature starting to put a very um, magnifying glass on the district of Minneapolis. And so as we expand that, you're looking at this pressure starting to build. But again, we've been having to go against uh, the culture that is, there isn't anything wrong, we're great, we're fantastic. I mean, we're Minnesotans, we're better than everybody else. Our men are good looking and our women are strong. And it, you know, it's just the Lake will be gone effect. So yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> we're all above average. So, um, but that's basically what we've seen taking place so far. I think that if you were to use what we are doing in an area where you already have a cultural momentum going towards and seeing we need to change things, you're going to see that needle move that much faster. And again, I think that we need to remember too is that you know, policy, politics, legislature, it is all just the tip of the iceberg of culture. It is a reflection of the culture. So wherever the people are at on an issue is basically where you're going to be in the legislature and on policy. If the people shift and move, and cultural change doesn't happen in a year or two, I mean, this is something that takes a lot of work, but if you change that culture and change how people view the issue, you will see that political uh, result, so. Yeah, and, and I think that's particularly true where you have a culture that is receptive to mm -hmm. the change. And as a Californian, I'd say that the best thing Vergara will do is for the rest of the country because I don't think it will ever be implemented with efficacy in California. Maybe true. <laughs> um, we have probably time for both of you if we have. Okay, okay. Uh, Joe McTighe from CAPE, the Council for American Private Education. Mike, I wonder if you could talk about the techniques that some journalists use to bias a story while making it appear like a balanced story. For example, I've always contended that the the New York Times is as slanted in its coverage as the New York Post, only it's more sophisticated and subtle in the way that it slants the news. It's got uh, you know, quotes from both sides, but what quotes it uses and where it places those quotes and what facts it selects and where it places those facts is like dealing with a used car salesman. You know you're getting fleeced, but you don't quite realize it. Yeah, I used to do that all the time. Um, <laughs> And, and, and it's, it's very easy. I mean, you sit there and, and you talk to somebody for 10, 15 minutes, get their confidence, they loosen up, they forget they're talking to a reporter, they say things, <laughs> and they see it the next morning and, they, and they're not happy. Um, you, you know, who, who you choose to talk to, um, uh, what quotes you use from them. Um, I could write, a story every day bashing Rick Scott and they would be accurate stories and uh, I could never write a piece bashing a Democrat and and so no one could say I'm being inaccurate um, I can call you up at, at 
at 10 minutes to five and say, I'm, I'm writing a story about how you uh, embezzled $50,000, uh, do you have a quote? And, and give you five minutes to respond and, and you say, well, I deny it. And then I'd go, well, he denied it. Or you say, give me, give me time to, uh, to, to get back to you on this. And I'll say, well, he, he refused to comment. So, I mean, there, there's just, there's just all, all sorts of ways to do it. And, you know, the, the media is liberal. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, by and large, most, most reporters are responsible. I don't, I don't want to give you the impression that, that, they're, all, that they're all acting like that. But, but you know, it does, it does happen. But most reporters, though, the good ones are, are accurate and, and, they, and they will. I mean, they, they might have an agenda, but they're, they will, you know, make sure that the other side's covered. And that's where the value in the relationship comes right. in. Right. Um, having a face with them. So if, you, if you're talking to them, if, if um, like on education reform, if you can show them, that, like in Florida, we've elevated African-American fourth grade reading two and a half grade levels in, in 14 years, and and you can show them that uh, it uh, you know that 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 at least will be in their mind when they write, and so they'll they'll consider it. Over here. Um, hi, I'm Christy Bassett. I'm a Florida public school teacher, and my question is: What advice would you have for teachers who want to be uh, quality advocates? What could we do to um, help hone our message and get it out there? You know, Christy and. Congratulations, too. I think Thank you're, you. Uh, Florida's you know, top teacher. So, um, but I would say that you know one of the things that work that's helpful for us is just commenting, uh, mm -hmm. coming on and saying, "Look, I'm a teacher. Things need to change." Just that simple presence of being able to say, "Look, I'm speaking from authority." they're right about these things and they're wrong about this or mm -hmm. the way the proposals I think it needs to be tweaked in this way but there are problems in the system that we need to address and I'm frustrated by this getting that out to the public I mean we welcome it use our our reach to be able to do that and to be able to get your message out to a broader public so and that would be just one example of what you can do so yeah I'd actually kind of tie the previous question together with yours mm -hmm. a bit I, I actually I I can't speak to every article in the New York Times or in the, in the New York Post, but I do think that by and large, at least in the media that we track, and we track it from across the country, I do think we're winning the media over. I, I don't see that many articles that I think are inherently negative as it relates to, to ed, uh, education reform or education quality. Um, and a big component of that actually I do think is the, the educator voice. So one of the things I think we, we really need to escape, and I think a lot of organizations are doing great work trying to escape this, but is this anti-teacher uh, frame that, that the ideas that are, are shared here over the last two days are in some way anti-teacher or that they're partisan in any in any real way. I mean, right when you stand up, you say you're a lifelong Democrat. I mean, I'm right there with you. Like, this is a bipartisan or even a nonpartisan issue in many respects, and the, the teacher voice on our side has been hugely missing. So, a few concrete things you can do. One is I'd happily engage you on the Vergara side of things, <laughs> uh, but there, I'm sure there are a dozen other organizations out there that that could use your uh, use your voice that would write an op-ed for you and make them do the work for you. Um, but putting your name out there, getting your colleagues to put their names out there, to talk about how the conditions in schools are to your detriment is, is a big part of that narrative. And I applaud you for, for being willing to do that. I, I think that there are a lot of teachers that would really appreciate that platform. Um, you know, we have a platform, and it's not the one a lot of us want to use. So yeah. um, we appreciate having an alternative and, that and, has you know, different goals. And it also takes someone like you to make it safe for others. So that's actually, yeah. you standing up and doing that is the hardest piece of it. So. I would Thank agree, you. and it's even more difficult in the schools. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more question. Yeah, my name is Emily Schultz. I'm with the Alabama Coalition for Public Charter Schools. We're working to enable charter schools in Alabama. I think one of the things that we're struggling with right now is this um, tension between the message of creating the case for why we need them um, and not bashing um, traditional district schools in doing so. And so I think if y'all, I feel like I think you did a masterful job of this with the Vergara case and just how we can um, create a really compelling case without isolating ourselves from traditional district schools that I think could benefit from this and see it as a tool. So could you talk a little bit about that decision point and that tension? Sure. Um, 
So I think you heard a little bit in this, this morning session again that, that Campbell uh, hosted. The, the, I have a lot of different thoughts and we try to organize them in, in some, some order. Uh, one is I think there's a misperception that the work you're doing is anti-public education, that somehow a charter is other than a public school, right? And so at its kind of first point is to argue that you're actually trying to advance public education generally, and I would use the word public education as opposed to somehow distinguish between a charter and a district school. I think it gets too complicated. The second is, in your, the politics in, in your state are obviously a little different than the politics in mine, but the, uh, one of the things we had a lot of luck with was to, to show concretely who it is that's being disadvantaged and putting a face and a name uh, to it as opposed to just a raw number. So parallel examples, we do work in Connecticut. Connecticut has about 40,000 children stuck in chronically failing schools, and a word like chronic I think is critical. Um, and they're in schools that we know are failing and have persistently failed over, over time. And so we very much tried to, to isolate the geography onto those particular schools and explain why it is. And I think to the point earlier, take teachers back out of it. They're in those schools not because the teachers aren't performing well. They're, they're in schools that have other structural issues, right? Um, another piece is, is evidence. So one of the things that gets lost often in this debate are where are the actual facts? I mean, where's the research? Where are the studies? I mean, clearly like this idea that if you're born into poverty, and you can't learn, that there's no, there's no correlation between those two things. So being able to show otherwise, I think, is important. So it's, it's a bit of a layer cake uh, type approach, right? I think your, your overall narrative is, is a quality public school for every child in, in your state. Your sub-narrative might be something about getting them out of chronically failing schools and schools we know that are failing and giving them a choice as to where they, they might go. You'd have to test whether choice in Alabama is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but it's a layer cake type approach, and then it's repeating the heck out of it. I mean, it's just beating it to death until you're so bored of your own message and then beat it some more. Because um, that's, that's what it takes to penetrate. And I'd be happy to think about it with you in more detail if you'd like. Great. Thank you everybody so much. The conversation does not end here. There's so much more to discuss on this topic. And we actually have in the spring, we're launching a MOOC um, on communications. Yes. Allison, I just want to make an announcement. Paul Vargas from California. This morning, the California Teacher Association will be filing a lawsuit saying that parent volunteering is forced labor at charter schools. <laughs> um, but please sign up for the communications <laughs> MOOC. It's called Ed Policy Leaders Online. You can learn more about that in the Digital Learning Lounge. And I think there's an insert in your program as well. And honestly, if anyone has follow-up questions, I don't have the answer to everything myself, but you can always email me, Allison, A-L-L-I-S-O-N, at excelined.org. If I don't know the answer, I can ask one of these guys and find out for you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.